You are made of meat, my friend, all the way down. The following podcast uses words like and and also. If you're not into any of that shit, then now's your chance. Three, two, one. Run. I'm super familiar with the Wilsons. Get it. Welcome to Super Familiar with the Wilsons. I'm Amanda. And I'm Josh. Hi, Josh. Guess what we're going to do today? Oh, I don't know. You do know. We're going to talk to our friend, friend of the program, Chris Barron, lead singer of The Spin Doctors. And the singer of our intro song. I've, I've told the story about how he unwittingly... <laughs> sang to us sang that song serenaded us and you grabbed that audio as quick as you could i could yes we had a wide ranging conversation with him and i actually probably break it between a few episodes oh i'm sorry am i boring you (laughs) am i boring you i at least yawned away from the microphone no hush Hush. No one would have known. Um, this was not about Chris. I did not yawn during our conversation with Chris Barron. No, it was very interesting. We started out talking about parenting for quite a while, and then we talked a little bit about just like what it's like to be breaking into music at the time that he did, where there was still... People like the Rolling Stones. Uh, well, the Rolling they're Stones still here. Are, are still here, <laughs> but like so, Keith Richards is a little preserved. I'm not quite sure if he's still with us, but he's with us. Yes, he's he's present mm, physically. <laughs> but so I wanted to hear some of the stories of of him hanging out with those so dudes. So interesting. So he tells us that we'll hear that in, in a little bit. Uh, but first, we did miss last week because the the recording schedule with Chris was off a day and then by the time we got that audio it's like uh let's just let's just take a week off and recharge and then just be ready for this week so one of those two things has happened we did take a week off we did not recharge we did not recharge you're not ready for this week (laughs) well we did we did a thing we went to disney springs on saturday and i didn't think about the date of the calendar when we were going to Disney Springs. We happened to be down in Orlando taking the 17-year-old to the airport and stopped back by Disney Springs with the 7-year-old and it was May the 4th. And I realized this as soon as we walked up to the Lego store and the line was longer than it is for some rides because you could... I was really having a hard time figuring out what, what it was. You could put together a little square and then stick it up on this mosaic installation so there were lines everywhere. There was a line outside and there was a line inside and you could make your take and make your little Star Wars minifigs and and then people dressed up all over the place. It was super, I found it interesting. I, you're, you may not have been present. You were just mad because your feet were hot. No, I was mad because I didn't wear the right underwear for the occasion. Oh, I'm sorry. What did you, did you wear your thong? No, 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 no. I, I didn't take my thong out. Wait. What? No. <laughs> where I, do you keep uh, your thong? <laughs> where, where does one keep most of a thong? No, 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 no. It's first of all, I wore black jeans, yeah, which I'm, was a mistake. Really it was cool in the morning, but it turned out to be in the nineties by the time we got to Orlando. But in addition to that, I was wearing boxers. Oh, instead of boxer briefs. Instead of boxer briefs, which is what I usually wear. And so there's too much room in the boxers for accumulation of swamp oh that's really sexy that image thank you well i'm just saying that it's for me i need i need tight coverage i need to hold things in i don't need extra areas for (laughs) developments you know what i'm saying developments like people were moving in and like all i wanted to do and building buildings so there were a couple times where i had to, to go to the restroom and just like sponge everything down but i What I wanted was, I'm sorry, should I have not said that while you were drinking your drink? It was almost a spit take. I'm sorry. Well, also because I know that I think you took the seven-year-old to the bathroom five times while we were there. And I'm just wondering if he was like, Daddy, what are you doing? Well, no, he wasn't watching. I went into a stall. He was doing his business because he's the one who initiated the five times. But I was happy for it because each time I got to go in and just like- Air things out. (laughs) towel things off and just like (laughs) otherwise it would have been a a biosphere it would have been like you know swamp (laughs) land with you know ferns and and (laughs) aquatic uh, animals and no so what i need to have is i need to have some sort of system by which i can 
You know how they have those those dryers on the wall? Yeah. Right? They need to have one of those in each stall that blows cold air. Okay. So you can just cool things down and dry things off. It's no good the way they are now because it's hot air and that, that would be defeating the purpose. I had to I had to utilize the hair dryer on the wall this week. I didn't tell you about that. So I was at a meeting at a hotel uh, that, that we were having this this business meeting at for two days, just training. And I was wearing a dress and I went in to use the bathroom and my dress wound up in the toilet. But not like clean toilet water. It was before I, anything had happened and I caught it. Wait, you just said not clean toilet no, water. No, not bad toilet water. It was clean toilet water okay, is what I'm trying you. to say. Got so you. just my dress was wet. So I, I went out and I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Like the meeting had just started. I'm like, I can't leave and go home. Like I have to, you know. So there was a hair dryer in, or a hand dryer. And so I had pulled my dress up and twisted it around because it was the back of my dress and was blow drying it. But unfortunately, my bottom was facing the door. So when you walked in, it's just bottom right there. Fortunately, it was a colleague of mine I've known for a very long time who was a friend when she walked in. I was like, what? And I dropped my dress really fast. But my point of that is it would be helpful if we could have dryers in the stalls and then you can just choose which setting, cold or hot, that you want. Yes. Oh, man, I would never leave. That would be great. <laughs> You're just gonna so there in. you go. That was a thing that happened. Speaking of dresses and how dresses, in many ways, are a better way to go. Yeah. You know, for example... If you're in that situation that I was in, you know, walking around Orlando, 90 degree heat, like you got a dress on, at least things can air out. This is why I wore a dress to, yeah, do- to Disney Springs. So, kilts. Oh, yes, there you go. Kilts, I think, are, are an affectation that I want to uh, adopt here. I think it's fine. No one knows you're not Scottish. Yes. So, speaking of Scottish, we have uh, some Scottish friends. I have been talking to John, John Watson. He is the sweetest guy, or at least I think he is. You're not sure what he's saying to you? (laughs) I love love texting him. Like, we go back and forth, um, but I can't get, you know, 75% of what he says. I understand his wife perfectly, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, she's she's perfectly understandable. The thing with him, we first heard him on the 100 Things We Learned from Film podcast, and I always just kind of assumed that he had a shitty microphone. (laughs) <laughs> not the case sorry john no john takes all of this in great great humor and he's agreed to this new segment that i want to start called what the fuck is john saying <laughs> i love this so much i don't know is always going to be my answer every time it's like the song quiz but i just don't, i don't know so i'm going to play this this word or phrase from john the scott and you get to try to guess what it is, and our listeners try to guess what it is. You want to hear I do. this? All I right, do. here we go. He's going to say some things before the phrase as well. Okay. That you probably won't understand. So here we go. Okay. Right, mate. I'm going to give you two versions. I'll give you the fast version and the slow version, so you can cut in whatever one you want. So. So he's giving us a fast version and a slow version. And we can cut in whatever we want. Okay, but you're But I know that you didn't understand the cut in whatever I didn't. Want. I yeah. understood the first. I was proud of myself. I was like, oh, I speak John. Yeah. And then All he right. started talking and I so didn't So here we go. That. So folks, Amanda, everyone, listen up. What is John saying here? If you can say it's a bra brick, moonlich, nick the nick, you're all rich, dick in. Okay, fast version. If you can say it's a bra brick, moonlich, nick the nick, you're all rich, dick in. What? Hope that works. He went. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know. John is doing. It, it's like he's an auctioneer and he's trying to sell me a pig. Right. So what do you think he was saying? He something about you're all right if you can say this thing in 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 Brokeback Mountain, then you're all right. All right. One more time. Ready? If you can say it's a bra brick moon lick nick and nick, you're all right then. If it's a bra brick and the neck and neck and you're all right. What is he saying? What do you think he's saying, folks? If you're out there and you're like, I know exactly what John is saying, get in touch. FamiliarWilsons at gmail.com. I mean, you can choose to Google what you think it is to see if you can get a better idea. That would be cheating. I don't give a fuck. I'm not going <laughs> to check your work. What do you think that John said? And then we will reveal the answer next week. He said something about a neck and something about a lock and something about a brach. 
I have no idea what he said. I don't know what he said. Okay, well. well. But I like it. <laughs> this is the thing. I really enjoy the Scottish accent. I just have no idea. I listen to a lot of like Scottish romance, like audiobooks, not like Outlander. I can't do that. Like these are like kind of like the rom-com version of Scottish books. Okay. And they have the Scottish narrators and I, I do it to try to train my ear, but I still have no idea what he just said. No, that was particular. And by the way, folks, I've been assured by John that every one of those words are English words in a Scottish accent, that none of them are like Spanish or Ukrainian or, or Gaelic or anything like that. Yep. All so right. There you go. All right, so now to our talk with Chris Barron. So we've interviewed Chris. This is the fourth time, three yeah, other times. This was my favorite conversation with him. Yeah, I know. It was, it was very good. It was really engaging. I've never asked him about, like, to, to name drop. I've never asked him to tell stories, like ro- the rock and roll lifestyle story, mm-hmm. because I felt like he always gets those questions. Mm-hmm. And so I've always tried to ask him things that he's not been asked before. But then I was like, number one, what's the point of having a, a rock star on if we don't ask him those questions? But number two, like, I would enjoy telling those stories if the roles were reversed. Because you're reliving it, right? Because you're like, reliving yeah. it and it's dead ass cool, like if you met the Rolling Stones and you yeah. toured with them or whatever. So I asked him to tell us all the stories. So here is part one of our conversation with Chris Barron, Spin Doctor musician extraordinaire. Hi, guys. Hey, Chris. Hello. I'm here. I heard you needed me to be here, so now I'm here. I was like, I'm not doing it without Amanda, bro. I know, dude. I was, listen, Josh is old. And so we went out for his birthday on, on Saturday. And Go on. I maybe had too much to drink and got really sick. But then it like stayed around for five days. So I think maybe it was a stomach bug. Oh, man, that sucks. Yeah, so sorry we missed you Monday night. But thanks for being here tonight. Yeah, well, I mean, it wasn't really a plan. It was sort of like, what about now? I'm lonely. My wife's out of town. This is... I'm sad. I want to talk to your wife. I'm lonely. Let's, let's talk on the phone. I want. I need some wife. I'm fives. So I am. I'm doing like. I'm going to seed, guys. Like my kitchen is a mess. I'm eating a peanut butter and honey sandwich for dinner. At least like there's bread because you're not just eating it off a spoon. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm not. I'm like actually gonna go and like sit down and eat this and talk to you guys like you know it's yeah it's not as bad as it could be you know the thing is that i do all the are you guys recording yeah yeah that's fine okay good because um so many people like this is the best part of the interview <laughs> like when you, it is like so what are you doing ah, i'm like you know scratching my butt in my underwear like that's that's what the people want to hear Listen, this is the like us magazine version of like celebrities. They're just like us. They take out the trash and stuff like that. So, you know, they stand around in their kitchen and they eat peanut butter and honey sandwiches while scratching yeah, their bottom. Yeah, wife's out of town. They have no reason to live. Clean up everything before she gets home. Please clean up everything. Oh, I will. Yeah, tomorrow is tomorrow is a big like clean up day. It's not it's not okay. it's not really that bad. Okay. All right, good. It's not a total total wreck. It just needs a little sprucing up i don't think it would be a, a time for for you and us to get together if you weren't eating something i don't know if you recall that last time we did this you got your chinese takeout come to the door while we were talking oh my god i forgot about that that's so funny because i almost got chinese takeout <laughs> that'd be very very new york of you oh yeah so get this we've had you on three times and i've never ever ever asked you to tell any stories of meeting your heroes or I kind of want you to name drop because I've never asked you to do that before. Like, for example, yeah, I know that there's a story because you hinted at it. I think the second time we talked to you, you were trying to decide what kind of front man to be. And you had some sort of experience with, I want to say the Allman brothers. Oh man, that's a good story. You know, like, you know, growing up in, 70s and 80s 
there was this like impression of lead singers that they were like snooty and haughty and arrogant, which isn't really how it turned out to be. You know, I met like Mick Jagger and Robert Plant, and they're like the nicest, coolest, down to earth people. I mean, maybe they were more like that in, in, in the 70s or whatever. Maybe they were more arrogant back then. I don't know. By the time I was like starting out being a singer, I was like, oh man, you know, do I have to be like that? to be successful as a lead singer and i didn't want to you know i was like so much work and i don't know i don't just like, don't want to be like that and so the first big opening gig we had was opening up for the almond brothers at the middletown raceway in uh, new york and um we went on and like did our show the crowd really liked us we watched the almond brothers from the side of the stage and it was like our first time watching like a legendary band from the side of the stage. That was really cool being that close. They finished their set and they're coming off like in between their set and the encore. And Greg Allman, you know, he's just coming off stage and he sees me and he corrects his course and walks right up to me. He goes, ah, I'm Greg Allman. <laughs> and he sticks his hand out. You know, I take his hand and I go, I know. And he goes, dude, I dig your band. And I was like, whoa thank you and he's like and your record's great and i was like thank you and then he like walked by i was like what the fuck and then dickie betts same thing he's coming off stage sees me walks right up to me sticks his hand out takes my hand he goes i'm dickie betts and i was like yeah i know and he was like <laughs> you guys are great thanks for opening for us i was like are you kidding me thank you for having us and he was like man the record's great love you guys and i was like wow Thank you. And then he just walked off. I just stood there and I was like, wow, you know, well, if those guys can be cool, I'm just going to be cool because that was awesome. And I've always seen it that way. I don't see myself as like a big deal. You know, I see I'm like right now, I'm like a dude in his underwear <laughs> with some dirty dishes, you know, just, it just, just drank like a mug of oat milk and ate like a peanut butter and honey sandwich. I also needs vacuuming. And like, there's a cat on my lap and I'm um, wearing like a buff around my neck. And, you know, like my coffee glass coffee table needs like some Windex. <laughs> Everything's sort of disheveled. And, you know, and my wife and my daughter like think I'm a mook, you know, <laughs> and I get like, I just get ragged at home. I mean, once in a while, though, those guys are really proud of me. And oh. that feels really good. But, you know, but like, but I know, I know that like there are people to whom like fame is a big deal and who have never been anywhere near a lot of the things that I just take for granted. I've been on television so much that it doesn't phase me at all. And I've met a lot of really famous people. Um, that phases me a little bit more because I'm a little bit starstruck. I, I actually like cultivate a feeling of like starstruckness in myself because I like the feeling of being like knocked out by meeting somebody I really admire. So I've like never, I don't know. I think you harden yourself to that because you have some idea. Like a lot of people in show business are like, I'm not starstruck at all. And they say it like it's some kind of a virtuous thing to say. Yeah. And in some cases, maybe it's just true. You know, maybe they just aren't, you know, they're not that kind of people. But I like, I'm fucking knocked out when I meet somebody I really admire. Um, particularly people outside of music, you know, I, I meet like golfers and stuff and like, whoa, <laughs> or like authors and shit like that. But I don't know. So there's a really great passage in uh, Cyrano de Bergerac. Christian is standing underneath the balcony and Cyrano is speaking through him. He's like, you know, I tremble. And Roxanne is like, why? And he's like, because one word from you from that awful height would be like an arrow and it would go right through me. You know, one harsh word from that awful, like she's up on a balcony and it's, you know, like a metaphor, but I feel it. I feel that way. I feel like when you're talking to some people, you could be gruff with them and it would, that would be their memory of meeting you. And I, I don't see myself that way, but they do. And I have to honor the fact that some people see me that way, you know, and whether I see myself that way, or not. And, and so, like, I went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I was um, Frank Zappa's daughter, me and Unit Zappa's date. And uh, we were, like, friends. And um, when Frank was being inducted, 
And that was the night that Led Zeppelin was being inducted. Right. And, you know, there's like a cocktail thing. And then everybody was sort of moving to their tables where they were going to sit for the induction ceremony. And I found myself walking next to Robert Plant. Nice. And I introduced myself and, and he was like, oh, hello, how are you? And I just like fucking opened my mouth and started saying the dumbest shit about <laughs> Led Zeppelin, like about like gushing, you know, I just started gushing. And I was like, shut up. What are you saying? You fucking idiot. But I couldn't stop talking. And then, and then I stopped talking. I was like, Oh God. And he just said something like, well, I don't know about all that, but it's lovely to meet you. Are you having a pleasant <laughs> evening? Totally like brushed it aside in this super tactful way and made me feel totally cool. It's fucking Robert Plant. You know what I mean? Yep. If he had said like, oh my God, what are you talking about? Or something, I'd have been crushed. I would have like never gotten over it. It would have been like every time I listened to Led Zeppelin, I'd have had this like cringy feeling for the rest of my fucking life. But because he was like deflected it skillfully, you know, and we walked along for another like five seconds. Have you met Jimmy? And I'm like, oh my God, it's Jimmy Page. <laughs> He's like, Jimmy, <laughs> this is Chris Barron. He's the lead singer of the Spin Doctors. Jimmy was like, oh, it's lovely to meet you. <laughs> and I was like, nice to meet you. He shook my hand. He's like, how are you this evening? And like, he was just being so dashing and like debonair. And I was like, Oh God, it's so great to meet you. And he's like, it's lovely to meet you too. Perhaps, perhaps we should meet again <laughs> some other time under more convivial circumstances. And I was like, this is the fucking greatest, man. I don't know. That's the way to be. You know, like when we open up for the Stones, you know, I could say they were cool. You know, I've been playing rock and roll. I've been playing songs I wrote on the guitar for money since I was like 14 years old. I like to think I'm like a pretty cool guy. I'm a guitar player and a singer in a rock band and, you know, hang around musicians all the time. And like, you know, I like to think I have like kind of a, a cool demeanor. You can call the Rolling Stones cool, but it's different because the word cool was invented to describe them. Yeah. You know what I mean? They like sort of predate cool in a way i mean cool was invented like sort of like more about miles davis and yeah. and John coltrane but you know what i mean they're like they're in that like they're in that 10 year span where like the idea of cool was being born we were going to open up for them obviously like i'm a huge rolling stones fan and i ran into one of the guys who played guitar for the black crows he was like so you're opening up for the stones like, yeah He's like, all right, cool. Well, when they give you a pass to get back into the Voodoo Lounge, the Voodoo Lounge tour, the backstage area is called the Voodoo Lounge. And when you're on like a big arena tour like that, you know, you have like different passes and they, they, they have like different access. You know, you look, everybody knows like about an all access pass, you know, but if you're the opening yeah. act, you don't necessarily have an all access pass. In fact, on a, on a tour like that where the security is really tight, you know, where like Mick Jagger, has like a dressing room, you know, the people who have all access passes are like the band and like six other people, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, so nobody has like an all access pass. So if you're the opening band, you don't have like, you have sort of a no access pass. You're just mm -hmm. kind of like, you can have your dressing room and get to the stage and you're not necessarily like invited to the backstage area of the band. And that's a whole other story. But eventually I got like, the little credential that got me into the voodoo lounge. So he's like, all right, so when you get into the voodoo lounge, Ron Wood and Keith Richards play snooker every night. Mm. So if you find the snooker table and you hang out near it, those guys will show up at some point. And if they ask you, if you want to drink, ask them for a Guinness. He was like, they don't drink Guinness. They drink vodka and orange, but for some reason they like people who drink Guinness. <laughs> it's like, okay, cool. So, I had this ukulele at the time and like, you know, Jason Mraz and all these guys and like, you know, Eddie Vedder made a ukulele album. I was playing, I was playing ukulele before any of these guys mm. were playing ukulele. And, um, back in the late 20th century, like in the nineties, we're selling like 50,000 records a week and I started to make some money. And so I would get super high and I would go buy gear 
And so I'd go into a guitar store and I'd buy like, you know, a $3,000, like 20th century, $3,000 guitar. And there were all of these ukuleles around old ukuleles, like Martins and, and Gibson ukuleles from like the, the teens and twenties. And nobody gave a shit about them. They were like 150 bucks, 300 bucks, something like that. So I'd buy like a really expensive guitar, you know, I'd spend like five grand or something in a store and they'd be like, you want a ukulele? And I'd be like, yeah, cool. I'm high. I'll take a ukulele. It's fine. I'll take a ukulele. Yeah. And it turns out these, these all, you know, I have these like old Martin ukuleles that are like really valuable now back then uh, that I got for free, you know, yeah. but I was like walking around with this old Martin ukulele playing like start me up and like playing start me up on the ukulele and being like, Hey Keith, <laughs> like, you know, like you, no, you wasn't actually there. You know, I was like, Hey, Keith, like what if I walked up to Keith? I was like, Hey, Keith, remember when you wrote this one? You know, nah, 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 nah. You're like just this stupid thing, you know? And like, um, I was like, fuck, I, you know, I hope I don't, you know, I hope Keith doesn't hear me doing that or whatever. Cut to, we get called into this trailer. The band does. There's a guy in the trailer. He was like a character out of a Guy Ritchie movie, mm. like the gangster guy, the big ham fisted, like super scary guy with like a Cockney accent. And he's like, I was like, fuck, they heard me doing the, the <laughs> Keith Richards start me up thing. Like, or they're going to throw us off of the tour. And, and, and I was like, really fucking scared. And he's like, give me your nanny. Lammy is like short for laminated pass, right? Give me your nanny. It's like this, those backstage passes. Mm. So I take it off. And you got to understand, like, now I am in outer space without a spacesuit. <laughs> you know, like if I'm walking around back there, like this is a fucking Rolling Stones tour. Somebody sees me walking around like that guy takes my Lammy away. Like the cops will like throw me out of the venue at mm -hmm. best, if not like whatever, to haul me off to jail or something like that. I cannot be in here. So the guy's got my Lammy. He's holding on to it. And he goes, lads, I've got one question for you. And I was like, oh, fuck, what? <laughs> and he's, where have you been? And he puts this like orange sticker on my Lammy mm. and I'm like, what is happening? Like, is that like a demerit or something like that? Cause we had laid really low apart from the, the, the ukulele shit. Like we didn't try to meet them. Didn't try to get backstage. Didn't ask for anything. So I thought we'd been really good. And now I have this like orange sticker on my <laughs> Lammy and I'm like in trouble. And I'm like, what is this? And he goes, that gets you into the voodoo lounge. Oh. And I was like, Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm not in trouble. <laughs> it's like, no, it's just like, come on and hang out. So take that. And I go into the, I go into the voodoo lounge, find the snooker table and, um, the voodoo lounge, like everything was decorated like a bordello. You know? So mm -hmm. I find this, like this lamp that's got this dark shade on it and this like weird, like tassel bobble things hanging mm -hmm. off of it, like hanging out in the shadow. And then, then like Ron Wood comes out and racks up like the snooker table. And then Keith comes out and they're like, playing snooker and I'm standing in a shadow and finally like Ron Wood like turns around and he goes, Oh, mate, uh, um, uh, and I go, Chris, he goes, Chris, spin doctors. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, how you going, mate? And he grabs me by the shoulders and he's like kind of jostling me like gently, like in a friendly way. Like, how you going, mate? You having a good time? I'm like, yeah, this is the fucking greatest. And he's like, you want a drink? And I was like, a Guinness would be nice. <laughs> and he's like, Keith, Keith, he wants a Guinness. And Keith's like, oh, he wants a Guinness. And they're like, put down their snooker cues. And like, they're like, come on, mate. And I'm like following Ron Wood at Keith Richards. And they go into this other area. And like, we walk through this little like 10 feet kind of door. And there's a little sign that says tuning room. Hmm? I walk in and there is like a million dollars worth of like vintage guitars mm -hmm. and amplifiers in there. And I never saw anybody tune anything but like a vodka and orange in there. <laughs> but like, you know, if you wanted to like pick up a guitar and have a little twang, like it was just, well, it was like a museum of like the coolest mint condition, beautiful vintage guitars. They give me a Guinness and like for like the next several nights, Every night, I'm like go to the snooker table, like take me back to the tuning room, have a Guinness while they had like a vodka and orange. 
just like talking to them about shit, asking them questions. And like, I was like in fucking hog heaven. And they were like, like one night Keith was like, oh yeah, we got really panned in Toronto last night. And I was like, they weren't getting great reviews. The shows were fucking amazing, but like the press was just like, oh, they're too old. They were fucking killing it. These shows were fucking dynamite. And um, they were like, oh yeah, they didn't really like us in Toronto very much. But they loved you. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I didn't read the, I didn't, I, I didn't, I wasn't reading the, the reviews. But they loved you. And like, um, um, you know, Ron, they were silly, like Monty Python. Mm-hmm. So, so like, you know, Charlie Watts, the drummer, come in and, and like, you know, um, Keith would like grab him by his lapels and be like, oh, you horrible little man. It's just like fucking awesome. And, and I must have been really comfortable because I have this memory. And then I was sitting on the floor, like sitting on my knees, you know, mm. with my like feet tucked under my butt. Mm-hmm. Like, and I was asking Keith Richards about like going into chess studios and like seeing like, muddy waters in there on a ladder like painting the walls because he needed extra money mm. talking about working with like Chuck Berry and mm. and um and it was like at this moment you know I'm sitting on the floor looking up at, like Keith Richards and I just go I just needed to like testify and I go I want to do this for the rest of my life mm. and Keith Richards standing over me like mm. holds forth his hand it's like the Pope of rock and roll <laughs> holds forth his hand and it's like gesture of benediction. And he goes, you will, man, you will. Oh, how great. And so I got that going for me. Which is nice. And you have. Yeah, he was right. Yeah, he was, he was right. right. I mean, did it happen because he knew it would happen or did it happen because he said it would happen? He willed it and it was so. And it was so, Yeah. We will play more of that interview in upcoming episodes. But now it's time for Refined Gay Thoughts with Refined Gay Jeff. Jeff writes, Hi, Wilsons. Happy week to you. I trust that things are going well and you're crushing this week, whether by accomplishing all the things or simply chilling out and loving life. Or being crushed by the week. Or, yeah. Yeah. We've had a little bit of both, Mm. though. Yeah. We did go and stay overnight at a hotel. That was nice. We didn't talk about that, did That's we? That's the same hotel that my dress got in the toilet at. Oh, is it? it was a dip, but I was there for different reasons. Different reasons, reasons yeah. yeah. He says, I'm coming off of a really great weekend. Friday, I met friends after work at the Ripcord. We enjoyed several rounds of cocktails. Also, my bartender, Thomas, who fulfills several fantasies <laughs> and checks several boxes, kept giving me free shots. Ooh. It was a good evening. So I will tell mm. you, we went and we stayed in a hotel room. It was a belated birthday present uh, for my birthday. So Amanda got us a little in-town hotel and we did some things. And then... It wasn't rented by the hour. We stayed the whole no, ac- we, actual we, night. We, we, we stayed the whole night as well. And we went to our favorite bar, The Bull Downtown. And our favorite bartender, who, by the way, checks none of my boxes, nor fulfills fantasies, mm-hmm. but he did... Give me a free, I don't even know what it was. It was a shot of something. It was like bitters, though. It I, was it, very strong, and it burned. He said it was like if Jaeger went to Yale and bragged about it, is how he described <laughs> it. So he owns the bar, um, and there was another tender there. So then he and and Amanda and I and Jacob's wife went to this new cocktail bar in town mm-hmm. called Kin Bar, K-I-N Bar. Mm-hmm. What a cool little spot. Yeah, it really was. We don't have a lot of listeners in Gainesville. Weirdly, all of our listeners are from other places. But if you are in Gainesville, go check out Kin Bar downtown before it closes up. It's another one of these little jewels that doesn't look like it belongs in Gainesville. It looks like like it belongs in a in a metropolitan mm-hmm. city. Such a cool vibe. And if you are a listener from Gainesville, their main cocktail menu is named after no longer open 
Gainesville bar establishment. So there's the rotator, there's the purple porpoise, but it's definitely a throwback to to Gainesville's nightlife. Gainesville's nightlife where people uh, came and they thought that they can open these great businesses and lasted for three years and then it closed. Yes. Welcome to Gainesville. <laughs> But anyway, I want people to go support this bar because it is super cool. Jeff then says, Sunday was a full day after church. I met several friends and we went to our favorite ramen place for lunch. That's owned by our friend Thomas. But this is Ramen Thomas, not Ripcord Thomas. There is no good ramen in Gainesville. <laughs> no, just, there's no good Thomas in Gainesville. Well, there's Chicken Tom. There is Chicken Tom. Also doesn't check any boxes or fulfill fantasies. Huh? Good. Yeah, but he, he plays with chickens. What can I say? Oh, God. But there is no good ramen in town. No. There used to be. Yeah, it went away. But it went away. Hmm, interesting. So anyway, um, Thomas is closing that location, sad to say. His 10-year lease expired, and the landlord went up 25% on the oh, new lease. Oh, my goodness. So he decided to close and concentrate on his other location That's downtown. Well, good for good him. Good call, Thomas, for having more than one location, too. It's got to start somewhere, these prices that go up. Yeah. And again, talking about downtown Gainesville, we went on Saturday, checked into the hotel, had these plans to go to dinner and go like I said, go to this pub, The Bull, and then wander around after that. And that was all set. But we had this afternoon time. Mm -hmm. Downtown is dead it on was the really weekend. really depressing. So many empty storefronts. And this is before graduation happened. So yeah. the students all in town. It's yeah. not like they were all gone and, you know, Gainesville went down to half its population. So what I don't understand is how these landlords who charge these ridiculous rates, and I know that this is so because... I know enough business owners mm -hmm. downtown. Is it a benefit to them that the that the properties are standing vacant right, and unused? So I don't understand why they keep raising the rates and you know these businesses come in and they inevitably fail and guess what? Your storefront is empty again. Your yeah. property is unleased. Make it make sense. Right. I don't understand. I liked your idea of basically it's like the surplus charging. Like, you know, when you get an Uber or a Lyft during really busy times, there's a surplus charge. And so it goes up a little bit. Right. I liked your idea of maybe during the during the, the school calendar year when there's more students like you, the rent's a little higher and then your rent would go down during the off season or whatever. That makes sense to me. Well, it's just that because these businesses, they make just enough to stay open in the busy times, right? They make just enough so that they meet rent and then make a little bit of money on the side for themselves yeah. when the students are in town. But then summers are coming and no one is socking away any money because yeah. it's a college town. It's not like you're making bank. I'm really now I said surplus pricing and I think I meant surcharge. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't okay. use either of those words when I was explaining that to you. So okay. so we did talk about melodies that get recycled over and over again because I'm in this um, songwriting group, which, by the way, um, my ego took a bit of a hit because the latest song I sent out and I didn't receive great feedback on it. Like, did you receive poor feedback? Y yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, and I don't want people to blow smoke up my ass. I want them to give me their honest opinion. Yeah. But I, at the same time, like I want them to like it. Yeah, sure. So I don't, I don't know that I'm built to be like a songwriter who has, who who's like has his songs it available for gets critics. Gets critiqued. Yeah. I think that I'm built just to do it for fun. Yeah. Um, because yeah, I don't like how that feels. It was very defeating, actually. I'm sorry that happened to you. Well, this is why I don't let you hear my songs. Okay. So anyway, says, are you familiar with atonal music? This is yes. Jeff talking. Are you? We've talked about it before. With, Arnold with Schoenberg is considered the father of atonal music, and some of it forces you to use all the 12 tones before you can use them again. I don't know if I've mentioned this, but Jeff is a musician, um, and that's why he can use all of these phrases like atonal and tunes. <laughs> tunes. <laughs> <laughs> he says that's called 12-tone serialism. Now that you've used all of them, you've created a row. Now that row can be played forward or backward or flip it upside down. In my opinion, it's very difficult to listen to and practically impossible to sing. It's very difficult to even read about. Um, <laughs> but it does force you to think outside the box. My son, Andrew, is a very talented musician, and he does use uh, microtone scales. Mm -hmm. So, Jeff, I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but microtone scales are scales that they use in some Eastern music where there's just more notes mm -hmm. than what we have. 
some of it's very hard on the ear because we're not used to that. Mm. But I still find it interesting. I don't know how one sings to it, though. I think Jeff's point is that you, you, you it's hard. I do love listening to different cultures' music. For our first date, you took me to Mongolian throat singing. Yeah, I did. That's not a euphemism. I took her to a concert. If you're not familiar with Mongolian throat singing, it basically sounds like... Except a little better, and to a beat. <laughs> That's exactly what it sounds like. Jeff continues, new things to review. In order to bring a little more humor into our lives, because we are surely in need of it these days... I suggest reviewing comic strips. So we asked if there's anything that we could review because there's about a billion movie review sites, some music review sites, some TV review sites. So what can we review? And Jeff is suggesting that we review comic strips. Like Peanuts and Family Circus? Yeah, yeah. People still writing these? Yeah, they're still... The I mean, funny the, pages are still a thing. Funny pages are still a thing, but they're very tiny these days is what I understand. You remember when we used to read the funny pages and it was at least like two pages? Yeah, yeah, like full color on one side and like whatever. Yeah, yeah. I or Family that. Circus was always full color. Yeah, I miss that. Apparently that's not a thing anymore. So he is saying his three favorite comic strips. What are your three favorite before I read Jeff's? I mean, I wasn't as super into this as, as most people, but I liked Family Circus. I liked Marmaduke because he was a big dog, and I liked that. And, um, I, I, dude, I don't, I didn't, was, I never cared for Kathy. She annoyed me. Um, I don't remember who else were these people. I didn't, I've never gotten to Calvin and Hobbes. Like, I know people who love Calvin and Hobbes and have all the things, oh, but I never got into Calvin and so Hobbes. So, Calvin and Hobbes was the only strip that I would try to cut out yeah. and save. Oh, did you like poster it on your wall? What no, 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 I them? just, I saved them. I just saved them because I th- thought they were funny. This was before they like made these books. Because yes, you know how the, they, the these anthologies of them, yeah. yeah. And so I I would, and I'd get really upset if I missed a day. Aww. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. All right, so what were. Calvin what? and Hobbes, I loved. I absolutely, of course, I came up on Peanuts. That yeah, was yeah. my favorite for a long time. And then the far side, I really love. Oh yeah. I, so this is what far Jeff side was says. a little too, um, a little too, out there for me. Yeah, no, I loved it. It's definitely my sense of it humor. It felt a little irreverent, and I was too churchy for that. Well, they didn't really talk about Jesus. Well, I bet they talk about stuff you can't talk about. Yeah, like cows being aliens. So the far side was one of his. It's very classic, and the author, of course, or the drawer, is Gary Larson. With a personal worth of about $70 million, he did quite well, keeping people laughing. Another one of his go-tos was Calvin and Hobbes, as I mentioned. Classic, popular, influential, academic, and philosophical. His least, or no, not his least, his la- last favorite. Mm. I was like, why are you putting your least favorite? My last favorite is one that you don't see too much anymore. I don't even know how popular it was in its day, but it was called Frank and Ernest, and I live for it. Every I remember day. Frank and Ernest. Yeah. I liked Shoe. You remember Shoe? No. Shoe was like the I don't know whether Shoe was an owl or an eagle or he was some sort of bird who was a journalist. He was oh. often at his typewriter and he wore a rumpled suit. Yes, I do have a vague memory of this. Yes, so I enjoyed Shoe. I think maybe I like Ziggy. Oh yeah, Ziggy was I think I just like Ziggy for the name. Yeah. Yeah. We're old. <laughs> Do they even have cartoons? Well, now they have graphic Comic novels. Because yeah, seven year olds super into these dog man things. And yeah, I just well, don't. That's true. That's true. But it's like little comic strips. Like it yeah. has little comic strips. Like it's graphic novel, but then in it are comic strips too. So you're saying that that didn't start in the newspaper? The dog man didn't start in the newspaper? I'm asking. No. Dog man started with Captain Underpants because Captain the guy who writes Captain Underpants is the guy who writes Dog Man and the kids in Captain Underpants write Dog Man in Captain Underpants. It's their comic. And then it's now it's it's this whole serial thing. And now there's Cat Kid. It's just it's an empire. Dav Pilkey. And don't say Dave Pilkey because you will get corrected by the seven year old. It's Dav Pilkey. Got it. Shout out to Dav Pilkey. Jeff continues on that he does not like foam in his drink or in his food, (laughs) enough said. 
He bemoans my loss of relationship with cheese. A little update on that. I've been enjoying some cheese. You have not cut back on your cheese consumption, so I thought you were over it. He wants me to take a trip to France, or us, to immerse ourselves in the gloriousness of cheese. Is that an option? You go to France? Yes, I would like to dip in the tub of cheese, please, and immerse myself in Gouda it's one, or it's, something. It's one of the, the yeah trip options that you can get. Like when you go on cruises, you pick the excursions for your day. That's, yes. that's your, your cheese. cheese is cheese. your option. I wonder if I'd enjoy swimming in cheese. I would not enjoy swimming in You like in cheese. queso? I do like queso, but I want to eat it, not swim in it. It's sticky. Yeah, okay. He says he's heard that our taste buds change every so many years, but he can't think of anything that he's no longer drawn to. He prays that this never happens with pasta and all the myriad sauces that can accompany it. My favorite being pesto. You know, I'm starting to lose my taste for pasta as well. Yeah. Sad, but I am too. Like, I just want it as a vehicle for like a cream-based sauce. But if you could just give me a spoon, I'll pretend like it's soup. It's fine. Yeah. He says, I get it with the Danny DeVito reference only in reverse. I really didn't care for him back in Taxi and the movies he did after, but I don't mind him him now. I'm not going to go out of my way to seek him out, (laughs) but if if he's there or shows up, I'll support him. (laughs) It's good to know. If Danny DeVito shows up at the ripcord, it's all good. Good. He has a comment on hip-hop and rap artists. I have no opinion because I don't listen to those genres of music and never have, even though James Todd Smith is quite nice to look at. Friend. Who is James Todd Smith, you ask? Who is... LL Cool J. Yeah, that's right. And do you know what those initials stand for? Ladies love Cool James. That's right. And guess what? He and I have the same birthday. Oh. I am five years older, by the way. So Happy birthday, Jeff. Do you know who I share a birthday with? It's not as cool as LL Cool J, but Mr. T. Mr. T, that's right. I always think that you're going to say Arnold Schwarzenegger. What is Mr. T's real name? Uh, oh, God, I used to know that. Ty- I think it's Tyrone. I think that the T is, is for uh, Tyrone. Uh, is it? Uh, I don't know. Okay, we could look it up. We are birthday buddies, but I don't know. I'm not going to look it up. Um, did you know that NCIS Hawaii has been canceled for next year? Oh, sad. Yeah, it's his favorite of the franchise. It is mine, too, because I'm really loving Vanessa Lachey as the female um, agent in charge. But also, it gave LL Cool J a place to be, and now I am sad. Jeff, why are you going to bring the bad news? Speaking of your Seattle quiz winner, I could totally live in the Pacific Northwest. It's my favorite part of the country, simply because of its beauty. It is so beautiful. I, I do have not love been it. There. One thing that surprised me about Seattle is the fact of how hilly it is. That's very true. That's the thing that I noticed when we visited the zoo there, that the zoo was... was, The zoo was hilly? Yeah, yeah. It was very very cool. People always know of San Francisco's hills, but not Seattle's. He says, I don't think I'd be too concerned about the possible earthquakes. I've survived tornadoes, hurricanes, and floods, so earthquakes seem like the next logical steps. Now... I think earthquakes would, uh, I don't know. Tornadoes and earthquakes seem to be pretty equally terrifying to me. But I think that you're more likely to know that a tornado is arriving than, or is approaching than an earthquake because all of a sudden the ground starts to shake. Yeah. And to me, it's like the ground is, the, it's my foundation. It's mm-hmm. no pun intended. It's like, at least I got the ground beneath my my feet if I got nothing else. And if you don't have that, all of a sudden, then you're fucked and I don't know what to do about you. So I think that earthquakes terrify me just a little bit more. He says, sorry to hear about your allergies. I never knew you suffered from those. How could you not? Me having allergies is such a, a like. A, a staple of who you are. It is it's such a fact of who I am. Jeff, I can't believe we've known each other for what? 30, 40 years. Wow. And you didn't know that I had really bad allergies when I was a kid, and I still carry some allergies. Were you today. ever a camper in Jeff's cabin? No, but... Does I, that seem like a thing that he should probably know about no, the I, children? No, I, I wasn't. I was okay. not. He's distraught that I'm allergic to pineapple and his favorite fruit, mango. It's my go-to when I'm at Jamba Juice. Mango a go-go. Well, not for Josh. It would be no go-go. Yeah, I've never tasted it. I don't know what it tastes like, so it's I don't really know what yummy. I'm missing. Got to go for now, Wilsons. Hopefully the rest of the week will bring you rest, joy, family, friends, and laughter. We'll talk later. Well, Jeff, I love you, but I'm mad at you because I didn't want to know this about NCIS Hawaii, and I realized you didn't personally cancel it, but now you've brought this news to me. And also, I got you that. Lawrence Terod 
That is Mr. T's is name. Is Mr. T's legal name. No, but he changed it legally in 1970 to Mr. T. So Mr. T is his legal name now. How does that work? Because I assume that the forms for names are, you want to change your name, okay, what's your new first name, what's your new last name? There's not just one space. So is his first name Mr. MR, just MR period. And his last name T. No, middle name T. Oh, well, no, I guess. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. One will never know. No one likes to be told what to do. And now's the time in the program where we tell you what to do. Amanda, what should we do? Go watch NCIS Y because you won't be able to next year. I have a recommendation. I have two musical recommendations. Two bands that I've recently discovered. One band is called Daydream. They're from the UK. You can look them up. I think that they just had their initial single which is very good. I wish that we could play it, but we don't have rights for that. Um, They're really kind of poppy, and please don't be disappointed in my choice of music because I just like like pop. I just like stuff that bops along. You like bops. I like bops. The band is actually called Daydreamers, not Daydream. It's called Daydreamers, and the single is called Call Me Up. And that's what I've had on heavy rotation. But I've also discovered this band that's been around for a few years. I think that they first hit in 2014, but they are an indie band, so I'm not beating myself up too hard never having heard of them. They're called Future Islands, Mm -hmm. and I freaking love Future Islands. You have been playing some Future Islands. So the song that... I heard that they played in 2014 that was kind of their their big song is called Seasons, parentheses, Waiting on You. Um, that's a great song. And then they just came out with a new album a year or so ago. And that album is called People Who Aren't There Anymore. Oh, well, that sounds really sad. The first two songs, though, they're such great songs. The first song is King of Sweden. Second song is The Tower. And what I enjoy about this band is like, again, they're they're pretty chill. The guy's voice is great. But he has some sort of vocal cord illness. Mm. Like, is he losing his voice? He's lost part of his range. And so how he's compensated for that is he'll be singing. And it'll sound very kind of sweet and angelic. He's got one of those like really nice voices. And then all of a sudden he'll break into like the the death metal. Like for a phrase. And it's so (laughs) unexpected. You have to listen to it. (laughs) And go look for some live uh, versions of Oh, he's got some dance moves. Oh, he does. He does have dance moves. But he when he does that, yeah, you know, that vocal thing, whatever he does live, it's really interesting to look at. So check out Future Island and Daydreamers, and they're from the UK. Here at Super Familiar with the Wilsons, we believe in the news. We believe in keeping you informed on the latest things happening both at home and abroad. So here we have our news correspondent, Daniel J. Buckets, who appears courtesy of the Casting Views podcast, with some news out of the United Kingdom. Daniel? We have breaking news here at Casting News. The nation is being plagued by psycho seagulls competing to be Britain's hardest sky menace. This week, we told how Liverpudlians are being terrorised by the XL Gullies Gang, a flying squad led by Bugsy Seagull, named after US mobster Seagull. But he isn't the only brazen brute stalking the skies. With listeners all over the country flooding our inbox with challenges to the top level boss who are making their lives a flight mare. Bully birds wanting to be top of the pecking order are ruffling feathers all over the country with hair raising reports coming in thick and fast from Essex, Norfolk and Scarborough to Sheffield and up to Scotland. Residents in the charming town of Beckles in the Suffolk and Norfolk broads are being harassed by a seagull so terrifying he's been dubbed Stephen Seagull after the tough Hollywood star and martial arts expert. Listener Martin said, This seagull walks around up and down the street as if he owns a joint, swiping any food he can get his beak on. Sheffield rock band Santiago Kings have also penned a song about an infamous feathered mobster with the same nickname who rules the city. Their lyrics say, Stephen Seagull, he's a secret eagle. Ben Flood added, The bird residing on your front page couldn't lace the web boots of Stephen. 
You may not be familiar with the bird in question, but Stephen has such confidence, such testosterone, such swagger that he truly believes he is a secret eagle. Megan Miller, 33 of Clacton on Sea, Essex, has a resident guard gull who she's called Judas, who rules her garden and attacks other rivals. She said, He's hardcore. Every time another seagull comes anywhere near, it will go for them and practically take a chunk out of the wing. Megan said she had grown fond of Judas for helping to rid her patio of dozens of scavenging seagulls when she moved in. She said his favourite foods are pizza, fruit and Cathedral City cheese, but suspects he heads to the pier to steal fish and chips at weekends as he's around a bit less. Back in Liverpool, another seagull who rules a roost at the waterfront near the Liver building is vying for the top level boss's crown. Listener Richard Eames, who sent in some snaps of the bird stealing a chip as he glared into the camera, said, There was no arguing with this one. Up in Scotland, Lisa Miller in Dundee is also being hounded by grub-grabbing gulls who peck on her window to demand food when they are hungry. And remember, listeners, stay safe, keep those windows shut and be on the guard for gulls. All right, Amanda, that's all there is. There is no more. What'd you learn about this week? Um, so many things. But mostly, I mean, beating a dead horse and all, I learned that NCIS Hawaii is canceled. I'm sad. It's sad. You don't understand. It's sad. Why are you shaking your head at me? But I really enjoyed the conversation with Chris. That was that was a really enjoyable time. I think we were on with him for like an hour and a half. So, I mean, we're just playing a little bit each time, but really, really great conversation. Yeah, I'm enjoying what's turning out to be our yearly chats with him. So, so that's pretty cool. Otherwise, consider this to be, you know how they have those, those, um, those membership drives on NPR. Mm-hmm. NPR is so, in trouble. Not the point of this. I know, but go support National Public Radio is my point to you. No, that's not my point at all for bringing that. This is a membership drive for Super Familiar the okay. Wilsons. So tell your friends to listen to us. If you get any enjoyment out of this at all, and I know that you do, you fuckers, because I can see, <laughs> I can see who's listening, and it's like I see a lot of the same cities week after week. So don't tell me that you're not enjoying this shit, because why would you do that for yourself? <laughs> like I don't even have that commitment to most things in my life. Okay, <laughs> so please tell your friends to give us a listen, and introduce us to to new folks. We won't regret it. All right, go be kind. Bye. Bye.
Got 